Well, I think we're in place here, so I will call to order our committee of the poll for Tuesday, January 7th, 2020. It's now about 5.37 for City of Duval. Uh, a couple of quick items. I'd like to adjust our schedule a little bit. Go to the order I'd like to move to the end. Just briefly, we have guests here tonight. I think that'd be more appropriate so they can uh, go enjoy the commute. And uh, uh, we have Jennifer Knappman on the phone. And so for the record, Councilmember Knappman is attending via the meeting via speakerphone. And um, certainly uh, we're set up so that she can text me if she wants to say something. And now and then I'll just check in with her to make sure we have a good connection. Jennifer, can you hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. All right. Uh, also, um, we have uh, council member Cole is communicating or uh, commuting through the, the uh, valley right now and uh, she's going to be here this evening but said she may be quite late to the committee of the whole but definitely be here for the city council meeting <coughs> um well, i think we can get started if if there aren't any objections to council the other change i'd like to make um we were going to have the state buyer go first, but they were likely going to be a little late, so we asked IT to come in, and so they came in a little early, and we'd like to try to get him out the door as well. So <laughs> if uh, if there aren't any objections, we'll have Andy go first and followed by state auditor and move forward from there. So Andy, are you ready? Take it away. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, hello, everybody. I think most of us have met. My name is Andy Latham. I'm from Snoqualmie IT. Um, we're just going to go over uh, 2019's goals, what we've been able to uh, deliver on, and just some of the highlights and some of the things that we want to celebrate too here in the city. So, pull up this presentation here. So, this is just kind of amended off of the one that PJ did for you last year. I wanted to touch base on what was already communicated um, and just give some updates. So, this is just what we're going to go over. So, I'm going to retouch on some of the goals for the year that were set by council. Uh, where we are right now, some accomplishments, and uh, our 2020 work plan, so what that's going to look like in the future, some of the challenges we've experienced this year, and then we'll open it up for questions, and you guys can go ahead and ask them there. So this is the original timeline that we presented to Council for 2019 and 2020, and um, these are the major projects, so we've added a couple things on here, <laughs> but this is the basic outline of what was originally brought to Council to begin with. Um, so one of our goals, let's talk about this for our budget goals, is we look at the city and how they're spending money and how we would like things in the future. We want to look at a policy of sustainment um, aligned with your council goals and objectives as you're, you're going to drive how this flows in the future while still meeting department needs and requirements, reducing costs where possible um, while maintaining public service goals. Uh, this is just kind of the, some of the things that we look at when setting the budget. I'm going to get into all of this as we've gone over last year, and if, you, if you'd like um, to ask any questions on this, just feel free to bring it up at the end. Man. So, uh, this is our plan for the city from the beginning. From the very first year that we were here, all the way into year five, which I believe we're coming into right now. So, um, you know, we started out a lot of firefighting, a lot of figuring out the city, getting to know everybody, the quirks, and uh, figuring out a plan to move forward, and then building that, building that trust with the city. So this kind of gives an overview of how we viewed our relationship with the city and where we wanted to be. Uh, so this is some of the accomplishments. This kind of goes over some of the projects that we did this year. Um, so we finished the access switch replacement. Uh, the course was, re was re finished late 2018. The other switches were all replaced throughout the other city buildings. Um, bringing everything into compliance. So we have new Cisco hardware. We don't have to worry about security vulnerabilities that were presented through the old switches. Uh, some of that stuff was purchased surplus equipment through Red, the city of Redmond. So it had gotten, a, it was almost in service for a decade or so before it was pulled out. Um, and we, it, we started feeling some of the pains because of that old equipment. And we still have one old switch to replace, but I'll, I'll take care of that this year. So we're moving forward really good with this one here. Uh, this happened earlier in the year, if, or in 2019. We had a, a complete failure of the phone system at the police department. Um, you know, the, the citywide phone system upgrade had been planned, but wasn't put into effect at that point in time. 
And unfortunately, uh, due to the age of the equipment, one of the pieces of equipment at the PD failed. But um, you know, we completely rebuilt them, got them back up and running. I think that uh, there was a presentation brought to that, but I think it took us just a few days to get them back up. So after that was finished, we went ahead and, and moved forward with the entire citywide phone system back in infrastructure upgrades. So there's a new server, there's a backup server in case something happens to PD. So there's a place for all that those calls to go back through. Um, there's two sites with failing over service. So if something were to happen to our public works site or to our police department site, the city hall and whatever remains around will still have active phone services. So the most that you might lose is access to voicemail or maybe access to a call tree, but all direct dial numbers and whatnot will still function. That was really important. Um, PD was a prioritization. They have their own direct line into the building. City Hall and Public Works both share uh, a single line that all their calls go through. Um, PD, even though we've had some issues with Frontier uh, and some of their infrastructure running down to our Public Works department, um, we haven't seen any issues or drops over at the police department, which, which is a big, very important place. So no 911 issues or anything like that. Um, so we've also replaced the, the firewall. We, uh, the firewall that was in the city, was, when we got here, um, had aged out. And it was, uh, it was a big vulnerability. And the city authorized emergency funds to purchase a temporary firewall to put in place. This firewall replacement is a full Sophos firewall. It's, we would consider a next-gen firewall. There's things in place to uh, protect the city from a lot of different attacks. It also gives us good visibility over what's happening in the city, and it also um, gave us the ability to, to set the VPN for our employees. Again, we lost that capability after that other firewall in one way. And then uh, the citywide computer replacement. This is what I've been working on for the last month and a half or so in the city, and is very near completion. <coughs> There's just a handful of computers that are left over. Uh, this goes into the Windows 10 upgrade as well. If anybody knows, uh, Windows 7 is reaching its end of life. For us enterprise customers, we have extended support through June, but the entirety of the city um, will have to be on Windows 10 before then. So that, that's part of the 2020 plan. Um, with the main focus on the police department, all of their vehicles still use that old, that old software. So that's just some of the things. I, I can talk about this real quick. Uh, because we cut down, the city used to pay for three individual lines into the three buildings, and, and um, we, didn't, we didn't need that. We don't, we don't need that capacity. We don't have 100 phones in the city going up all at the same time. So we were able to uh, get a cost savings about 1,200 bucks a month on our bill. It's significant. That's a cost of one line. Uh, on top of that, the original project cost was going to come in around $20,000. It came in around $9,000. So significant cost savings there. We're pretty happy about that. Um, so this is some of the. This is how prioritization, or this is how we prioritize things. So you can kind of see how we label and how we have labeled some of these and how they match up for sustainable type of things or data or business intelligence. So this is kind of an idea of where we put these projects in their um, in their importance. Sorry, we lost Jennifer Naplin for just a moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, some of these are 2020, so some of them aren't complete yet, like the uh, media archiving. Um, I think uh, what else is on here? Uh, all the Windows 10 stuff here. Windows Server 2016 implementation will also be in 2020. So some of the challenges. Um, we've been keeping kind of a running list. This is kind of something that we've been looking at. We've you know, we've established a life cycle here for the city. Uh, moving forward, every five years, the computers will be replaced. We won't run into some of the same issues that we've been having in the past, where uh, hardware is failing and we have employees that no longer have a workstation. We have to kind of put something together or jump through some hoops to get it working. Um, learn to be proactive. We're working on that. <laughs> I think that's a that's a thing that the city as a whole needs to kind of kind of think about. And you know, Stokowski has these 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 issues too. I think everybody does. It's hard to look three, four, five, six, seven, eight years in the future, and that's what we have to do. And sometimes 10, 15 years in the future, when you're looking at things like um, uh, the firewalls, or when you're talking about fiber infrastructure and those types of things, you don't want any of that falling apart. Uh, so the phone system's done. Um, data center locations. This is something that we've been talking about adding a second data center location. So if something would ever happen to the police department, the city itself could continue to operate. And we were thinking uh, public works would be the location due to the generator backup over there. 
That's why the uh, backup phone server is located over there. So, uh, fiber structure, infrastructure concerns, we got that all settled out. There was a new fiber installed in the city a couple of years ago. We have uh, 10 gig connections between all of our sites. It's really nice. It's not something you see everywhere. Uh, I believe this was part of the franchise agreement that worked out with Comcast. So whoever worked that in there, we weren't here at that time. They, they did good. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then the cable plant infrastructure, we've been working on this as well. Uh, all of the, the cabling between the servers and the switches has been updated and replaced. So that, we're in a good, good place there. There's still some funny things we have to figure out. But we'll talk about that another way. But I think that's it. So if you guys have any questions for me, now's the time. Andy, a quick question on the phone system. Yeah. So we show on this that it's been upgraded and we're in a good position. Yes. At one point we were talking about just because the phone system was so old, replacing the whole thing. Right. And I know we made some temporary um, adjustments so it would continue, but my understanding yes. was we still needed to replace it. Have we actually replaced the whole yeah. thing now? Yeah, that's So we have a brand new phone system. Yes, so it is, uh, we were on an old Shortel system. Shortel was purchased through Mitel. So my, we now have a MyTel system in place. But yeah, so we worked with them. We had a full plan drawn up with, uh, with NCA, who was our partner, and Allstream, who handles our dial tones, and um, came up with this plan for the redundancy and everything else. And we, we redid all the call trees and um, you know, got rid of that, extra, that license that we were paying for that they had to pay for. So that's all, that's all done. Brand new server, two brand new servers. Uh, the only thing that I, I would like is maybe some, some phones for these folks. <laughs> uh, our phones are working, but we have a couple of them that are having some problems. Is the backup server in a different spot that I hear you say? Yeah, so the backup server is located over at the Public Works Department. It just runs on a small little Lenovo machine. Uh, it doesn't do much, so it just kind of sits there until it's needed. And you mentioned the SoFo system, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it said there was a backup part, part to that, or not a backup, but a, a monitoring piece to that. Yeah. Do we have the capability to monitor internet activity um, so that you know, it's not something that we want to watch over somebody's shoulder. Yeah. Uh, we just don't have any interest in that. But if a question came up, do we have the ability, if necessary, to go back and see what internet activity was taking place? So um, monitoring internet activity and being able, with enough data to pin it down to specific users or workstations, it generates large log files, so we typically, that, that's not the best practice for that. Um, generally what we would do is if it is needed, it would be put in place. The logs that I pull are problematic <coughs> websites, and if, so there's a web, if there's a website that, say, has a link on it with the virus, right, and a user were to click on that, the Sophos firewall would block that access, so that, 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 that information wouldn't go through, you wouldn't download that virus, and then it sends me information about the URL that that person visited and the IP address for the workstation that visited that URL. And with that IP address, I can say, well, that's Laura's workstation, or that's mine, or that's somebody else's. Uh, so we, we do have pretty granular information, but you have to set up something special if you wanted to yeah. kind of just broadly look at everything. Yeah, but I think that's usually what you do is look at it broadly. Again, I don't want to give me you know, any intent by counsel or others to be looking over somebody's shoulder, that's yeah. just not where we're at. Yeah. So, well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anything else? No? Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Andy. Uh, next, uh, I'm just really pleased tonight to be able to have the state auditors, we, they've been here uh, looking at our finances, uh, some specific areas. Uh, they've provided us uh, with a uh, uh, kind of an overview of some of the work they've done, and there's more available online, I understand, if folks want to sign up for that as well. Um, I really appreciate you being here in the evening. It's very handy to have all of us together the City Council, and I know that uh, your work that ends uh, prior to this, so thank you for your extra time this evening. Uh, it really does help us. Uh, I can't say enough about how much we appreciate both your coming here in the last several years. I think we've built a really good relationship. Our goal is to truly make sure that we're doing things correctly, safeguarding the money, our finances for the city. And if you have any, you know, you've provided recommendations, but certainly we are open to hear about any concerns you have or suggestions so that we can improve how we operate uh, fiscally. I also want to take just a moment to uh, for those that have not had opportunity to meet Dana Mason, our new fiscal and finance 
director. Uh, we are extremely thankful for you being here. And we've already seen just some outstanding work and, and uh, you know, especially managing the work group and helping us get back on track. And so thank you and uh, welcome. We appreciate thank you it. for hiring me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself and Absolutely. giving a little bit of background, uh, yeah. we certainly have citizens that uh, watch our, our video and, and may not understand exactly what the uh, audit is all about. Right. And so I'll turn it over to you. Okay. And, and say thank you. Great. Well, thank you for having us here this evening. Uh, we are, of course, with the Office of the Washington <coughs> State Auditor. We're from specifically Team North King County, which is based over in Bellevue. Uh, my name is Wendy Choi. I'm the audit manager for the team, and it's, um, gosh, August is 17 years since I've been with the office. And so it's always nice to be able to come back um, to the city of Duval. We do have this very good working relationship with the team here. And, for Clay and myself, we actually do know Dana from her prior local government that she came from, and she's also um, one of Dana and I used to be on the same team from the State Auditor's Office. So it's really nice to see Dana here uh, at Duval as well. Um, so what we can do, before I introduce, or Clay introduces himself, Heidi Wiley was the auditor who was the lead, but she was stuck on Woodenville Duval for, Road for quite some time. So you get Clay and I tonight, but Heidi <laughs> credit goes to her too because she was the auditor out here on site. Yeah. I'm Clay Shoshensky. I was assistant audit manager on this audit engagement. Um, and as Wendy mentioned, Heidi Wiley, who is the uh, audit lead, she was the one that was doing the day-to-day -day work and was here every day. Um, I was just kind of overseeing that work and was here intermittently. And so for our agency, as the state auditor's office, what is nice though, we're as the official auditor on record, we're required to come and perform annual audits, or depending on the size, it can be a two-year audit, but typically annual audits for state and local government. So what is nice with that, it's required by state law, so there tends to be a more collaborative, open relationship that we do have with our local governments. There is, for the city of Duval specifically, there are two types of audits that we performed, and those were fiscal year 2018. So the first audit scope is what we call the accountability audit. So that's ensuring the city is in compliance with state laws, regulations, your own policies and procedures, and really ensuring that if there's those certain areas that could be more vulnerable to potential abuse or loss, that those are the areas that we're coming in and performing a review to ensure that the city has adequate controls, policies, and procedures in place. Then we have what we call the financial statement audit, and that's more of a larger dollar amount type of an audit where we're reviewing the city's financial statements for 2018, performing certain procedures, and ensuring that those numbers that are presented on the financial statements are reliable, um, accurately, presented based on the work that we perform, and then ultimately we give an audit opinion, which is what the users, the public, the bondholders, um, grantees, that's what the users want to see is what would be clean or unmodified opinion. So for tonight, we want to share the results of the 2018 audit. So in front of you in your blue folder, the left-hand side is the exit conference agenda. The right-hand side are the draft reports that we're going over. So these reports are draft because we want tonight's opportunity to have that formal communication of the results. And then what we'll do following the exit conference is we'll work with our audit leads on which, um, remind me if that would be, is it Dana or are we going with Laura? Dana. Dana. Okay, so I'll check in with Dana, you know, maybe later this week, and if Dana gives us the okay, reports will be published on the website, and that's where the public can access it. Okay, so what we'll do actually right now is I'd like to hand it over to Clay, who will go over some audit highlights before discussing the audit report. So we first want to thank uh, Laura and Trish who are just instrumental in getting us documentation timely and really helping the audit move along. I know there was some turnover in the finance director position as we were going through the audit process. Uh, so we just really want to say thank you for making sure that you know we are getting information timely. We really appreciate that. Uh, we also thank you for your commitment to fiscal responsibility, especially on the financial statement front. Um, and then just an ongoing commitment to build a working relationship with the city of Duval. We feel that we have a really good relationship um, to build and that we've been built in the past with the city. And so we 
we thank you for that. It really helps our audit move smoother and really drive that risk-based approach that Wendy was talking about earlier. Um, so as Wendy mentioned, we do perform two types of audits, and we will flip now to the accountability audit report. So that first tab, and this is, as Wendy mentioned, our internal control-based audit. And we'll go ahead and flip to page four to go over the results of that audit. And as Wendy mentioned, uh, we perform our audits on a risk-based approach. We're reviewing things such as the council meeting minutes, getting a gain, uh, gaining an understanding of how the city operates, and what is the most important aspects of what's going on in the city, where that risk is. Uh, we do financial trending as well as other trends, like vendor trends, and uh, look at statewide risks that we're seeing with other entities across the state. Um, and then as you see, those uh, three bullet points at the bottom of your page, and these are the areas we decided were the most at risk for the city of Duval this year. And so we performed testing over small and attractive assets, and we looked at accounts payable, so general disbursements. Uh, we really focused on uh, electronic fund transfers this year. We're seeing that as a, a statewide trend where there's a lot of uh, fraud occurring in that area from external sources. So we really want to make sure that we're raising awareness with entities and make sure everyone has good controls in place. We also looked at credit card transactions, and then we also looked at some payroll, different payroll areas. And if you go ahead and look at the first paragraph on this page, this is where we talk about the opinion that we give on the accountability audit. Uh, so in most of the areas that we examine, the city's operations comply with all applicable state laws, regulations, as well as its own policies. So we do have a management letter related to small and attractive assets, and we have three types of reporting. So our first type of reporting is in what's called an audit finding, and that's referenced in our audit report as well as disclosed in our audit report. And then we have a management letter, which is just referenced in our audit report, however it's not disclosed in our audit report. And then we have what we call our exit items, or housekeeping type items. Uh, we usually just share those with management, they're not referenced or disclosed in our report. So in this case we have uh, a management letter. So it's it's referenced in the report, but not disclosed in the published report. And we have that on that management letter tab. So we'll flip to that and go through that. So as I mentioned, this is related to small and attractive asset tracking. So small and attractive assets are something that we identify and the city identifies based on policy. Um, those, those assets that can potentially grow legs and walk away. Attractive assets such as computers, uh, cell phones, chainsaws, that kind of stuff. It, a, a wide variety of different types of small attractive assets that vary by departments. Um, and this is actually a repeat management letter from prior audit. So there are some areas that we'd like to address, um, specifically starting with entity policy. And so we noticed that uh, entity policy doesn't necessarily uh, discuss the separation of duties between the purchasing, receiving, and disposal process, as well as the inventory reconciliation process. Um, and then policy is uh, silent on the threshold for what price threshold uh, small and attractive assets, uh, what determines a small and attractive asset. Uh, and then also procedures for who is responsible for adding and deleting assets from the listing. And then who is responsible for inventories uh, citywide as well as in individual departments <coughs> and the frequency that those inventories should occur. Uh, we also noticed that uh, the city's, the IT and administrative departments did not keep records of inventory accounts, inventory accounts to, uh, for us to audit. Uh, and then the city does contract out its IT services and so um, with another government entity, and that entity performs a lot of the tr uh, all the tracking and uh, purchasing and maintenance of IT assets. Uh, but we notice that the city doesn't have controls in place over ensuring that um, that reconciliation, like inventory, is occurring. Uh, the kind of the city is relying on the, um, the other government to perform those monitoring functions. Um, and then also uh, we talk about making sure that there's uh, procedures in place for properly tagging small and attractive assets uh, and making sure that it's, it's tagged uniformly by department or citywide. 
Um, then we also performed physical testing of small and attractive assets. So a couple of ways we test, we look at your asset listing and then we uh, go from the list to the physical asset to see, you know, is what on, is on your list, is it actually, is it in your possession? And then we also look at physical assets and tie back to the list. And then we also pull some expenditures, uh, credit card expenditures, regular AP expenditures, and then we tie that to see, did it get put on the list? and is it still in your possession? So we ended up testing 43 different assets across different departments in the city, and uh, the results we found, we found 14 assets across the IT, public works, and police department that didn't have tag numbers or unique identifiers. Um, sometimes it might not just be a tag number, there could be a unique identifier, like a computer could have a serial number, um, or something along those lines. Um, just something that we can identify it uniquely. And then we also noticed that one asset in the police department, it was traded in, but it wasn't removed from the asset listing. So just making sure that that list is up to date and complete and current. Um, then we also uh, identified two computer tablets in the police and IT department list that we could not locate. And two public work department assets that we were, uh, were not properly updated on the list. So it may have changed location, um, and just wasn't updated for that location. <coughs> so what we're recommending, number one, is uh, that the city reevaluate its policy and um, <clears throat> make sure the policy reflects best practices for sustaining controls over small and attractive assets, and then um, performing regular, regular inventory counts to make sure that your lists are complete and accurate and fully updated. And then implement procedures for monitoring, uh, make sure that there's a proper segregation of duty between receiving and disposing functions. And then make sure that uh, expectations of how the asset monitoring should occur is properly communicated to all departments and make sure our you know, staff is on board. Uh, and then our office does have some best practices for internal controls over small and attractive assets. Uh, we see this a lot across the, all the government agencies that we audit in the state. So we decided to put out as an office a best practice guide on our website. So we do have that out there in our resource database, which is a great place to start, especially as you're building policy in that realm. Is there any questions specifically related to the management of other small and attractive assets? I have a brief one. Yeah. In my experience, uh, the policies that you're expressing would normally lie within the finance department itself. So we would just simply, here's our policy, here's the procedure to accomplish that. Everybody gets trained on it. Uh, is that your experience and where you would normally see that would just be, you know, just part of the, the finance department itself? Yeah, so we do see a lot in finance, but it really, it, it depends on the departments and the complexity of the city. Um, and just making sure that, you know, does that work with other departments and how they operate and making sure that it's cohesive. Because uh, sometimes a, a one-size-fits-all a one isn't necessarily the best approach. So with something like small and attractive assets, that each department might have their own, just real specific, that, you know, when it's right. replaced or, or destroyed, we don't just toss it out, but we have to go back and make sure that we've we removed it from our our list of assets and so on. Exactly, and then just staying um, staying up to on what is still small and attractive. Uh, radios, for example, 10 years ago may have been $1,000 a radio and really attractive to steal. Now, may, maybe they're worth like 100 or $50, right? They're not as attractive to steal. Uh, an iPhone cell phone or something like that might be more attractive. So just reevaluating those lists, making sure it's current, um, and then it's it's meeting kind of that risk assessment that you do when you just, just to reassess that list and see if it's still current and applicable to today. The city as a local government has some flexibility as far as what you want to define as small and attractive because we do also understand there's a cost benefit that comes into perspective here as well. But then also the key is making sure if departments are going to have their own individual processes that as the city as a whole is in agreement that we all agree that this process is what we would expect and that it could be cons it should be consistent though too. When there's decentralized departments, sometimes there is a bit of a risk that certain departments will have their own set processes and it may not meet the same expectation that finance or council or executive may want. 
So just making sure that if the city does decide there will be departmental procedures, that the city as a whole, there's going to be that type of review or consistency. Um, because the key is having the proper written procedures, policies in place so that the staff know what the expectations are in writing and then also maintaining the right records to support that audit trail that an inventory count did occur and this is the review process of making sure that all assets that should be there was accounted for and if it's being removed, there's a proper protocol in place. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Any, Any other questions or Accountability areas we reviewed? I, I guess this is just, um, obviously we're just getting this. I assume that if we follow up questions, we can contact you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So my business card is in the portfolio, but then also on the last page of the exit <coughs> conference agenda, we included email addresses and phone numbers <coughs> for ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. I want to pause just a moment. Jennifer, I just want to make sure I haven't seen any message from you, but I wanted to just make sure that if you had any questions for the auditors up to this point. I'm good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Awesome. All right, so we just have a couple more pages to go through on that accountability audit report. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do reference the financial statement audit, which we'll go over a little bit more in depth, uh, but that is referenced in our accountability audit report. Um, and then if we keep flipping to page six, this gives a little information and the um, accountability, in the accountability that, audit um, should be on your left, left hand side. Yep, that one. And on page six. Page six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this just gives some information about the city, uh, the city of Duval. Um, I know bondholders will go here sometimes to kind of see, you know, what is the size of the city and whatnot. Uh, so this is still in draft form, so I encourage you to read through the description of the city. Uh, if there's any changes that you'd like us to make before we publish our reports, uh, Lindy will reach out to Dana before we hit publish on those reports and uh, make sure that we're all on the same page. And then just the, the remainder of the accountability audit report just provides some information and contact information about our office. And that's the accountability audit report. Is there any questions about the report or any areas that we looked at? Awesome. Now we'll go through the financial statement audit report. Leaves on the right side of your packet. And again, we'll flip to page four. And uh, you just notice the top of that header on page four, it's missing the I, but their macro mm -hmm. command. So the I will be there yeah. when it's this published. Is the independent. <laughs> yeah. Just like independent. Yeah. <laughs> this is soft. Yeah, that'll be the one that's They're published. Okay. Um, yes. So this first page just talks about if we identified any internal control deficiencies related to our financial statement audit. And um, as you can see going through this, we won't read through it directly, but we did not identify any internal control weaknesses that require reporting on the financial statement front. Um, and so if we go ahead and flip to page five, one thing that government auditing standards also requires us to do is to report on any sort of material non-compliance that could be with laws, state contracts, or grants. Um, and we did not identify any material non-compliance that needs to be disclosed. And if we go ahead and flip to page seven, this is where we give our report on the financial statements and our opinion on the financial statements themselves. And just talk about our responsibility. Uh, as I mentioned, we perform our audits in accordance with government auditing standards. And the city does report on a regulatory basis, the cash basis of accounting, which is allowable and accepted in the state of Washington. Um, and we'll flip to page eight. And this is where you can point citizens to if they ask, uh, how do we do on our last financial statement audit? This is the best page. Or, it talks about an unmodified opinion on the regulatory basis, so that's the cash basis in the state of Washington. Uh, and that second paragraph, so uh, fairly presented in all material respects, the cash and uh, cash and investments for the city. Uh, so that's a good, clean audit opinion on the regulatory basis. That's what we want to see. Um, we do have an adverse opinion on 
US GAAP, and that is for every cash basis entity in the state of Washington receives this. It's just something that auditing standards require us to report on. Um, and this is solely just because the city does not report on the GAAP basis. You're not required to. Um, you've complied fully um, on the regulatory basis. Uh, bond holders, issuers, um, they just care about that regulatory basis and having that unmodified good clean opinion. Um, but we do on the next page, page nine, we can kind of just explain why we have to put that uh, adverse opinion on U.S. GAAP. Is there any questions on that? The only piece that's not included in your financial statement report is on page 11 is kind of a table of content. The actual final report that's posted online will be much larger because it will include the clean set of financial statements that we perform work over and get the opinion on. The final report probably goes to like 30 or so pages. Yeah, and if you just keep flipping through the financial statement packet, as Wendy mentioned, that table of contents on page 11, um, that will have the, the published statements in there. Uh, any questions on the financial statement audit report? Uh, pretty, pretty good, clean audit opinion for fiscal year 18. Like I said, that's what we want to see, so good there. Um, and then we will go ahead and jump back to the audit agenda, that first page that we had. We have just a couple pieces of required communication to go over. Um, so as you mentioned, recommendations uh, not included in the audit report. Uh, we, we have a management letter that was just related to the accountability audit. Uh, no management letter for the financial statement audit. Um, and then we did have some exit items. And like as I mentioned, those are housekeeping items. Uh, we don't plan to go over those today unless there are any specific questions. Um, is there any? I guess my question is, do all the council members have that information? Mm -hmm. um, for the exit items. Yes. Right. I don't know why we wouldn't go over them. And it's up to the council, if you like. We understand exit recommendation, lowest level of reporting, and so we provide a copy to management. And then I believe council may have received a copy, or if there's any questions, we can go over them. I think we should go over them. Okay. Yeah, are there any specific questions that we can, uh, that you may have related to the exit items? And what we did, you know, typically we don't include a copy in the exit conference packet, but if you'd like, we can go over if there were specific questions that you did have, or we can just discuss. I wanted to leave it up to council, especially so that we can kind of move the meeting for us. Yeah. And I will say uh, that the first one we did have before on the payroll and voucher approvals, having the auditing officer in place. Uh, based on some follow-up with Dana, we did determine that that issue is fully resolved. One thing that I wanted to point out, unfortunately, they have a finance administration committee, and both um, Council Member Langell and, and uh, Council Member Holger, two of our members, and then on the speaker phone is uh, council member Naplin, so those are our three council members. Uh, they're often more directly involved and uh, are often our voice nice and part of this process, so it's not unusual that they might have more in depth questions. Yeah, no, totally. Absolutely. And we're here to answer those. So. I have to open my computer up because I need to print it. Yeah. I don't know if you have a printed copy with you. And so, what we could like do, any? if you'd like, um, we just have like a copy for us just in case there were questions. But if you want, honestly, it's just a couple of them. So I can go over it real quickly okay. and then have yes. that. And then that way what everyone <laughs> can have kind of up and running. Um, so the there was a payroll voucher approval recommendation. So that's actually been resolved. They know was able to get us some additional information. So we'll provide an updated list of exit recommendations. That one is no longer an audit issue. Um, there was a recommendation for payroll vacation and administrative leave. So just so you know, exit items are lowest level of reporting. They're not referenced anywhere in the audit report. They're housekeeping items that still are important enough to us to make note of. And if exit items do go unresolved, we'll just do a follow-up, make a note of that, and then exit items, we just repeat them. Um, depending on circumstances, they don't necessarily always elevate above an exit. Uh, exit recommendation or best practices. So 
Um, with that said, there was payroll vacation administrative leave. We had, um, this was a prior year follow-up. In the 2016 and 17 audit, we had some recommendations regarding vacation leave and administrative leave. And during the follow-up for the 2018 audit, we had just determined that our recommendation from the prior year was not resolved. Um, you know, we do also recognize that there was turnover as well. But the vacation leave audit recommendation was that the city did not have adequate internal controls in place for ensuring all cash leave outs and buybacks comply with the city code. So, you know, with transition of a new finance member, just ensuring that future cash outs and payouts comply with the city's written codes and expectations. Um, and then, and yeah, and to that point, um, just this is one of the many items um, the auditor's office knows we've been discussing internally mm -hmm. and uh, now that we finally have a finance director in place getting the policies that tell mm -hmm. people exactly what to do mm -hmm. it can be confusing and being that our leadership structure has been lacking um, sometimes it's been difficult for people to determine who actually should be signing off on their their stuff um, and so with dana here we will be tightening those controls um, which is part of the standard operating procedures that uh, we want the department to have. And that's why, you know, when they're exit recommendations, we'll do a follow-up each year. It's actually a required planning procedure that we have to do where we'll sit down with our liaison and say, these were the audit recommendations from the prior year, what has been done since then. So like in the case of the smaller attractive assets, that was a management letter in the 2016 and 17 audit. Because we felt, based on the items that we did identify as significant enough that we want corrective action. So something similar, that's why you see a repeated management letter. So then next year when we're here for 2019 audit, we'll sit down with our liaison and have the conversation and um, you know, make sure we give the city credit for what has been done. And there were some improvements on the management letter for small and attractive assets. Mm -hmm. So right. it, it wasn't just a, a complete repeat. There were mm -hmm. some improvements. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, and so that was the same with the administrative leave, the prior audit. So this stems from the 2016-17 audit, just ensuring that um, there is a policy over, over the monitoring of any administrative leave. So the key is kind of similar to small attractive assets, making sure there's, there's written procedures and policies so that everyone is on the same page as far as expectation and processes. And that also ensures there's a consistent practice and that it's equitable per the city's written expectations. And then there was another exit item regarding federal procurement policy. So the city of Duval does not need a federal grant compliance audit every year. When, a, when the city expends $750,000 or more in a, federal, in a given year in federal expenditures, we're required to come out and perform the federal grant compliance audit. So in the prior years, the city was subject to a federal grant compliance audit because of the amount of federal expenditures that you had. And one of the recommendations we had back then had to do with the city's procurement policy in regards to federal regulations. So there's certain that have to be included in the city's procurement policy from a federal standpoint. The city, um, there, and it was in regards to federal procurement thresholds, the key objective here is that the city needs to follow the stricter state, local, or your own procurement policies if you're going to use federal money for any purchases. And in some instances, the federal regulations, the code of federal regulations, is stricter and could be even much stricter than city law or city internal policies. So there's certain expectations from a code of federal regulation standpoint that needs to be included in your policy. Uh, this is actually good that we're mentioning that it's a housekeeping item because the additional information wasn't included. But this federal procurement policy, if the city was to have a federal grant audit in upcoming years, we'll need to see that in your policy. It has been allowable to be an exit recommendation in prior years because it was a new requirement from the feds and they allowed a three-year grace period. That grace period has ended. So for any audit starting 2018 and on that are federal grants, single audit related, um, you want to make sure that that federal procurement policy is resolved or else um, we may not be issuing exit recommendations. The federal government may want a higher level. So that's just something, but you know, the city of isn't consistently required to have a federal grant compliance audit. So just something really to keep on your radar. 
And then the, again, the exit recommendations were all just the result of the prior 2016-17 audit, so we understand there was the turnover. Um, there was another exit recommendation regarding payroll municipal code and just some um, prior recommendations that we had to have the city ensure that their current practices comply with state law. And so one was in regards to um, the, the city's code and its requirement over vacation, as well as um, making sure that what the city's practices aligns with the actual state law. There was a slight bit of a disconnect there. Okay, so just making sure that um, the city consult with legal counsel to determine if what the city does have in its current code, if that would ensure compliance with Washington state law. And then there was um, a payroll union overtime piece, and it had to do with, in the 2016 and 17 audit, review cities over, the city's payroll overtime calculations, and had determined that the city um, had not correctly paid um, <coughs> officer for regular hours worked. And um, there was a variance based on, it was like a, based on an 86.67 hour pay period. Um, so essentially just making sure that the um, cities, the calculations are properly calculated and properly supported. Yeah, and then uh, the other piece of that is just related to union contracts. Uh, one thing we noted in the union contract, it talked about overtime and how um, sometimes when you work more than eight hours in one day, that employee would be eligible for um, any time in excess of eight hours that day would be paid at one and a half times their hourly rate. Um, and then it would also say if they went over 40 hours in a week. So that can change the calculation and how is, you know, how did the city want it to, um, like what's the city's intent for paying that? Do you want kind of just kind of clarifying that in your bargaining agreement? <laughs> So it does kind of go back to policy or written procedure, kind of um, documentation, clarification. The key kind of goes back to that same message of what is in writing as expectations versus what's actually happening and making sure that the two align with each other and that it's consistent citywide. So. Mm -hmm. And, what, and then general disbursements, um, which was during the current year reviewing credit card transactions and just had found some instances where the, um, it was two months of credit card purchases where the uh, credit card voucher, it was signed, it was not signed by someone other than the cardholder. So you just um, was signed and approved by someone other than the cardholder. So you just wanna make sure that the cardholder is not reviewing his or her own transactions and ensuring that it, and signing off that it's, it's appropriate. Just ensuring that's that appropriate segregation of duties, ultimately to have that proper audit trail. And then uh, there was a purchase for um, just a gift basket that um, we would recommend that the city consider that's an appropriate use of public funds. And then that was one piece that's more of a electronic funds transfer disbursements. Right that um, we provide some information, but we tend to like to not discuss that during the open meeting, um, just because of the sensitivity. So if the city did want to discuss it, um, if I've been through this with another local government, it would be more appropriate to call an executive session. Um, but you can also look at that one last exit recommendation and contact me if there's any questions or we can talk about it. Um, you know, just executive session does allow the um, public to be excused for this particular item just because of the sensitivity of the system. So, any questions? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Could you explain to me, there's um, a recommendation to consider appointing an auditing officer. Could you yes. explain what that is? Yes. yes. So that was um, mm -hmm. some additional documentation that Dana was able to provide to us that the city actually does have that in place. When an auditing officer does, it's um, they're able to certify claims before they go to council for approval. Um, and there's certain requirements that need to be met. There needs to be a policy in place. They need to be bonded up to a certain amount. Um, and then it needs to go to council for approval at the next council meeting. So it's, it's, it's a way to make sure um, because sometimes you don't, the council doesn't meet before you know, warrants need to go out or payroll or employees need to be paid. So it's a way to make sure you're meeting your obligations timely. 
So did you say we have that in place? That yeah, is. So actually, we just, it was um, this morning, it was kind of brought to my attention that Dana, this kind of third transition, was able to find the Oh, okay. <laughs> what a great time. Thank you for the information. I just. <laughs> and so it, the, the city has it. So it's a recommendation that we were able to take off as of this morning. So it's really nice. So who does it? Who's, who is it's the finance director? Finance director. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, maybe there was somebody else that, oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons uh, this particular section is important to me as a member of the finance committee is that um, what we become aware of is mm -hmm. that we, our code is in many areas very out of date. Mm -hmm. It's out of date really in a couple of ways. One, it might be technically out of date with current state law mm -hmm. or other requirements, other grant requirements. Um, another reason why it might be out of date is just because it's no longer a best practice in, mm -hmm. in government. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a situation where technically it's not an audit issue per se for you, mm -hmm. but it's not a best practice um, that we should follow given Duval. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third way we've, we've identified is um, that there's just, there's missing things. Mm -hmm. um, that Like we really don't have the kind of ethics or conflict of interest uh, policy that is mm -hmm. robust and clear and, um, and universal. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning not just to employees but to counsel mm -hmm. across the board. And I, this gets uh, particularly important in procurement. Um, and even though you know, we may not have $750,000 mm -hmm. worth of federal funds a day, that to me it's always been better to go with a higher standard, whether you need it in a particular moment or not, because mm -hmm. once you're in the pattern of have, and having the structure of a stricter standard, um, it serves you better than to not have it. Um, so what we're trying to do on the Finance Committee is is address the things um, incrementally um, to to bring us into a better place. So that's for me why this has been why this is very important and why I might have more follow up questions. Yes. We really need to have a work plan mm -hmm. for how we're going to address uh, strengthening our internal controls, um, how we're going to look at procurement, you know, how we are managing any kind of small vendor rosters all of those kind of things, and um, I'm not sure to what degree that's been looked at for a very long time. And you know what's good resources too is um, MRSC, the Municipal Research, MR oh, that's as far as I got. Um, <laughs> I, I was like, sure, I always that transition that way. Um, MRSC, the, the website, the Resource Service Center, and then our office actually, there are two great resources. MRSC does have um, articles and best practices, sample mm -hmm. policies and procedures right. that are available. And then our office with the resource database, the Center of Government Innovation has been doing a lot where we do different outreaches and um, presentations. Mm -hmm. So, and then we pre prepare a lot of material. So the date resource database was pre created to, as kind of a one-stop shop, to put some of these checklists and resources and information in where the local governments can go in and search by keywords and if there's a related article or even like Clay mentioned the smaller tract of assets there's actually a checklist that we put together our resource center that um, local governments can even consider as part of including as part of your control structure. Um, there are two great resources between MRC and our agency that sometimes we already have some identified best practices that can be good starting points. Um, so those I think are great resources. I think it's also a good tone that's being discussed mm -hmm. right now as far as, we always know that there's practices in place. It's a tough part getting it all in writing and make sure that everyone, which is a lot of departments and individuals, can all have that appropriate amount of buy-in or consistency. So, um, you know, it's it's a tough task with the policies and procedures, and um, it also is something that needs to be done in addition to the other workloads and expectations that the city may experience, but it is important to have. And so, um, so they, they're exit recommendations, these policy pieces, because it's more of making sure that what is in writing right now, does it still align with the city's expectation? Because a lot of things change, and it may not be as 
um, best practice anymore. So. It, I have a follow-up to that question, really, is, um, you know, we're going through a period of fairly rapid growth. I mean, a lot of our code was written when there was 2,700 people here. Um, and I'm sure the budget was much smaller. Um, and we're now on the verge of having close to 10,000 people in the near future. Um, are the, what I'm hearing from other small cities is there's this period of, of um, code change. And um, it, it's painful, mm -hmm. um, but necessary. Are the, you know maybe today's not the time, but I'd really be interested in hearing about the similarities that you have seen in the audit side um, for financial systems um, about these ch these small cities that are going through a lot of rapid growth. It's it, it's a lot to capacity building is a whole other function in addition to regular work is what I hear you say. So um, there may be lessons learned that we can learn from you on looking at other small cities. Right. And you know, for I think what's really nice about MRC especially because they tend to have consultants and specialists. Mm -hmm. um, for another local government, we had a topic that they wanted some feedback on about their policy, and MRC actually even had because they're. Our agency does that too as far as our Center for Government Innovation mm -hmm. group, but trying to identify some consistency and putting it as some best practices. Um, so I can get in touch with some individuals in our agency. Yeah, but MRIC, right. for example, with that situation is a compensation policy that they wanted for their local government type. And we were able to find that MRIC actually has several policy examples that they themselves felt was good best practices. And so our office will sometimes frequently recommend take a look at MRSC because they actually, in that case, um, was Commissioner of Compensation, there was like five policy examples that I was able to hand over. It was a four board of commissioner and you know, for a governing yeah. board member as well, and it was kind of neat. So there's definitely some resources out there that can help if there are best practices to, as a good starting point. Mm -hmm. And then our contract information is in the packet, so if there are questions. SST North King County, we may not need to give as much specific information or may not have a broader picture because mm -hmm. we're just, we service a certain area, but we do have our Center for Government Innovation as well. Yeah, so. that would be awesome. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions with the recommendation? So I'll just real quickly go over some concluding items, which is the exit, back to the exit conference agenda on page two. Um, we're required by audit standards to communicate if there were any uncorrected misstatements in the financial statements that we had to bring to council's attention tonight, and there were none, and that's great, and there were no material misstatements that could be corrected. And so that's um, what you want to see. And then as far as report publication, I'll check in with Dana maybe the next couple of days. Once we get the okay, we can move forward and publish the city's report. Reports typically go on our website Mondays and Thursdays, and then Dana is our lead, I'll get a two-day email notification informing her when the city's reports will be available online. But we also provided a subscription service link right there as well under report publication. We also included in your packet a letter called a representation letter. We're required to provide a copy to council, and it just shows um, the information that the city attested to during the audit that included faith to answer their questions, provided documents that we needed, disclosed information to us. So I provide a copy to council that's required with every audit engagement. Audit cost is, at the beginning of audit risk, was approximately $22,000. The actual cost will approximate that amount. The city devolves on an annual audit, so the next scheduled audit will be for fiscal year 2019. If um, typically here about the fall of the following year, so fall of 2020, um, accountability for public resources and the financial statement audit. And then, of course, that friendly reminder, though, if there is a federal audit, to please notify us because we'll need to be out here sooner. Next scheduled cost is slightly higher just due to rate increase that went into effect January 1st. So the next scheduled audit would be $25,000 plus travel expenses. Prior to January, we build at $100 an hour. Beginning January 1, we build at $113. And then a survey will come out at the end of the audit, so any feedback you have, we greatly appreciate it. 
And we've really touched on our local government support team and Center for Government Innovation. Um, us having our auditing relationship with Dana from prior place, um, her prior place, we know that Dana's very familiar with the audit resources that our agency has for local government support team, Center for Government Innovation. Um, so um, just really great resource. If you take a look and you have any questions, please just contact me. I can give you some links as well, especially for the center, based on some of the questions we have tonight. And then last page questions, Mark proposes our assistant director of local audit, Kelly Collins, our director, and then we just provide contact information for us as team members on North King County, and my business card is in the folder as well. Any other questions? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we really do thank you. Uh, I, I know that uh, Heidi's not here, but we appreciate her uh, you know, just helping oversee, but, but thank you for that. It really is, you know, I think one of the most critical parts for us as a city and being able to have confidence from our citizens is we're taking care of the money they entrust us with. And it's so nice to have your professional expertise come in and look. And, and you know, there's a lot of good news that we hear here, but also some areas that we can improve on. And I can't tell you how confident I am, especially with having a, a new director that uh, has also uh, been in your shoes as well, that we'll be able to guide us along that and make sure that we, we meet those in the future. Absolutely. Well, I we appreciate the working relationship too and the openness. So if there's any questions, just let us know. Back. Thank you. At the end of the year. <laughs> Thank you. Have Thank a good you. evening. We hope you have a good commute home. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to take me on the bridge on 124. <laughs> 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 I'll follow the play. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. And for Jennifer, uh, just so you know, we do have a, a, a copy of the audit report that uh, materials that we received tonight that we'll put in your uh, in basket. So that will be there for you. Um, well, our, our next item on here, you know, I, I'd like to go back uh, and we we'll got through the order I'd like to cover uh, as well. Tonight, I understand the chief isn't here, and we do have possibility they have uh, public works uh, provide us with. Just an update uh, from the department. Is that something you want to do tonight? Uh, I'm ready and willing and able to go Okay, we'll be forward with it. All right, absolutely. Let's go. Will we be able to, does this mean we get to ask our questions about agenda items like we have talked about in other PALs or no? Yeah. I'm just looking that. for instruction. So, Steve, how much time do you need? Because uh, it, well, it is a public works question. I as little well or as much as you want. And if you'd like to talk about something on the agenda tonight, there may be a slide that ends with that item. <laughs> yeah, why, why don't we do that? Why don't we do the agenda item? Um, Doc, do you want to do that? Do you want me to? I think you say go for it. Oh, my public works yeah, question? Yeah. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, yeah, it's the, um, it's the, my favorite subject. It's the depot. <laughs> um, the I've read the material uh, multiple times, and um, I'm not sure why this happened. So, I, and I want to belabor it. But what I asked for at the last council meeting was a plan for how we were going to address the facility, not just the deck. And the calculations on return on investment, um, uh, they weren't. Uh, that's that's not how I've ever calculated return on investment. Yeah, they're very basic. I am, yeah. And um, and the the frustration that I felt in reviewing the materials was that the fundamental question that I asked was, you know, we've got some items identified in the facility report that was obtained by Chief Kirk that could be more serious than others. And what I thought would happen would be that you would follow up on those couple of things in particular, and I'll be, one I was most concerned about when I mentioned at the council meeting was electrical, because aluminum wiring can be very hazardous. And so um, what I was looking for in your packet was something that was more specific dollar amounts 
tied to the most critical things in the inspection so that we had a more complete view of this investment because honestly a hundred thousand dollar concrete debt does not make any sense to me given that we have a deteriorating building and one of the comments I thought that really resonated with me was actually from council member Bernecki at the last meeting which was about you know putting a bunch of money into something and not really knowing where we're going with it and I just I kept hearing your voice as I was reading that and um, so I, I, that's what I believe I requested and um, so I'll leave it there we have contact electrician they have not been to the site yet it is in process and we don't have a contractor on staff so we are at the mercy mm -hmm. of that's you know, fine the folks um, that we work with so they've been contacted and they haven't given us any update yet so but have they been out to the building no we made them a report and shown them work on getting scheduled Oh, okay, so what other items were you planning on more specifically investigating? So I, I did contemplate getting dollars amounts, but without actual contractors giving us actual bids, I'm going to give you a number that nobody's going to be happy with when you get a real bid. So I considered putting some dollar symbols next to each sign, like a zero to a thousand dollars would be two symbols, and then a thousand to five thousand would be three symbols, kind of like a menu. But again, they're so far in between on who can come out and do it. Are they $400 items? Are they $1,400 items? I can't tell you until I get someone in there. And I can't get folks in there when I don't have a lot of support to get the work done in the sense that I'm just going to get someone to give me a bid. How many people are going to get to give me a bid when I don't actually have work to give? You know what I mean? So it's really hard. I can give you an estimate, but when it comes down to it, We've done that in the past, and nobody likes yes and it's wrong because it's based on the bidding cycle and the climate at the time that you bid something. So, well, I, I was mostly um, concerned just that an electric electrician. Here, here's the here's the thing. I don't I don't see a lot of sense in putting a hundred thousand dollars into a concrete deck when a building is deteriorating. Now, I'm not saying we don't do a deck. That's not my point. My point is that we need to have a comprehensive response to this and decide what's in, what's out, and. Public Works is the only place we're going to get that information. So, um, and, and, and there's prioritization, right? I mean, um, but mostly I don't want to have a deck and an unsafe building. So these things become, they are intertwined. And whether we like it or not, we have something more than a deck project. And I think that's what I said last time. I think um, as we get down to it, one of the big questions we have is you know, not just what needs to be done and where would the money come from, but this prioritization right. issue, you know, is there something else that's a higher priority in the city than that's putting that too. back on? So that, that's a, a council piece there that we're struggling with. We don't bring it up so you settle that for us, but just so you realize that those are the type of things that as we go to council and try to figure out, you know, and you gave us, I mean, there were other plans, that, you know, 100000 was kind of that upper part and there were some other options. But within that, we still have the questions and, you know, it's been this way from day one. You know, it's a nice asset for the city. It was provided with some understanding that we'll keep it up. Um, but with all the other things we're trying to do. So, Steve, you know, we're not trying to complicate your job, but just to let you know why. Yeah. And, and I realize you can't answer all those for us. Uh, certainly the numbers help, but for council it's really a, a struggle as we want to keep and maintain the building, but when we look at some of the costs and what we actually get out of it, that's that prioritization piece that we're challenged with. Yes? Um, so if I may, first off, the, the real struggle with the building is the fact that we can't just sell it. Because right. if you'd ask me, sell that thing. But now that we're committed, and the mm -hmm. it was brought up in the past with all the properties we have about investment. These are investments, and in the future we can resell it. All that goes. You know, when you think about it, like we all own homes here, and when our home, I know my home for sure, I put thousands into that home to just be at the level of investment. So if I were to resell, mm -hmm. I could get the market value. Now, uh, 
Unfortunately, in this situation, if we look at the prioritization for the investment strictly on safety, like there's no way we're going to be able to sell that building. Mm -hmm. We're tied to it. So the real question is, what do we do with that building? We must do something. There's no, we don't have to make a decision whether to do something. We have to. The decision is to do something. What would we do? And we have been holding off for a year now. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, we're asking the wrong question here. The question is, what exactly do we do not only for the outside for that deck? We have to do something with the deck. That's a known fact. But what do we do with mm -hmm. the building itself to make it where it's safe and um, where it's no liability and that we can use it? That's the real question here. So, um, and it's going to be hard because I can guarantee that that building, just look at my own home and remodel, mm -hmm. the numbers that are going to come up in front of us are going to be hard numbers to swallow. Yep. But we have no option. Mm -hmm. We own it and we're required to do whatever we promise to do with it. So we have to, I think we have to accept it's going to cost us a lot of money to do what we need to do. And we just don't know how far to go. I think you said it very well. You know, we just need to figure out what it is and, you know, try to make the best. I mean, there's certain things you can be optional about, like you can not paint it this year and paint it in two years. I mean, there's some things you can schedule out, but there's not, you know, if the electrical system has got bad wiring and we don't really know where the service is coming into, and we don't have a sub meter even to even really know what the electrical draw on it. I mean, all these things make it more complicated in the long run. And I, I want to fully acknowledge that, you know, that you've inherited this. Unfortunately, you've inherited all these facility things. And so, you know, um, but you know, we've got to figure it out on the budget side, and we can't do that. We, like you said, we can have a bunch of plug numbers, but we have to start somewhere and to solve at least the basics of this puzzle, and obviously the deck is part of that. Um, but um, I guess I can leave it at that. But I, I, that's why I said I felt like I was channeling you as I'm reading the thing. I'm thinking, Diane Bernecki, Diane Bernecki. I just kept thinking about what you said at that meeting. And, and one thing to add is that if you thought that was expensive, just remember, we bought a bathroom, and I take it about 600 a square foot. Mm -hmm. a bathroom. So, it, you know, it's, it, this is what we have to accept. And there are times where we make decisions on items that just don't feel good, but you say, let's just get it done. You know, we need a deck, we're going to use the building. Uh, we have other repairs that we need to make. I think that is a part of that total puzzle. I mean, if we know it was going to be a million dollars to make the other repairs, we'd say, you know what, we'll just cut our losses. But we understand that it's not anywhere close to that, that we can go ahead and move forward. Uh, again, each council member has to make their own decision on whether this makes sense. But there are times when we say, let's move forward. It doesn't feel really good, but it gets the job done and we can move on to other things. You know, I think your that perspective is so helpful to right on, yeah. understand that, you know, it's ours <laughs> and we have obligation to maintain it. Uh, and it is it does have an important part of our history. Well, Steve, thank uh, you. Well, can I just ask, ask one? There is, a, there is one thing that you did in that memo that I was like, uh-huh. Uh, so I'm really glad you put it in there. Is the mystery around why this isn't a fee eligible. I mean, you brought up that, so which made me then leap ahead was, what did they take out of that fee calculation? And you know, I'm not asking you to answer that, but what you, the policy issue you raised is, maybe we need to be, now that we're looking at new information around what it costs for some of our public facilities, which are effectively part of our park system, Maybe we need to be rethinking that. We, and we've talked about that this year, about you know how relevant our fee structure are, and are there some things that we need to be rethinking and recapturing fees and stuff like that. So I, I appreciate that you put that out there, because um, who would have thought that this wouldn't have been part of that fee calculation? Yeah, the number was in the agenda item when we get to it there. Steve, yes. uh, Council Member Naplin has a question. Thank you. So I <clears throat> was just thinking about the grants that are available through King County Parks, and this is technically, I believe, a park asset. Mm -hmm. Have we considered um, putting in a grant request for this facility? Um, 
it's actually a smaller dollar amount. Seems like you know you could frame it in a way potentially that could be you know very justifiable that it you know provides you know, maybe park access for individuals that wouldn't typically use a park or you know for recreation or activities. Anyway, just a thought. And then also it's you know it's not technically a historic building in the same way that the Doherty farmhouse is, but is there a potential to get um, funding through that avenue? So I can answer both your questions. Your first question, with King County Youth Sports specific, this isn't a good candidate. There are other King County Parks style of grants, but the majority of them look to and like to be very activity based. So this isn't a good candidate for that. Um, we do have a grant round coming up that we're going to have a, a little staff get together on to determine what we have and sense and then put something on the agenda to come talk to council about. So um, those are specific to parks and the active parks. So not a good candidate there. The other element you asked about with historic buildings. So King County for Culture is happy to invest in historic structures. You know, the city put a grant app in for Doherty Farm. So we were awarded that. I believe it was a little over 27,000 for the roof on the Doherty building. And that was uh, just announced in December. So I'm not sure when specific timelines for that type of building um, grant application timeline is, but I'm gonna guess it's later in the year. That's the case that we just heard in December on 2020. So. Does it help us, Steve, if we put some of our own money into the maintenance and things and the county sees that we ourselves are you know, committed to it? It just depends on the programming. It doesn't, it kind of falls it's not an active space use. It's not really good for any of those eligible um, grants. And it's technically not on the historic register, but it is obviously King County knows us and what we own and those assets and how they are here and they are important. So it could be a candidate. I think I want to ask them about the deck in particular and they weren't all that interested. But again, we can apply for anything, whether we are successful or not is another story. Yeah, because your memo said that there, you know, we are there. You know, Sandblast uses it, for example. Ball days. I mean, there are active uses. It's it's not like it, there are no active uses. And if it was cleaned up, there could be other active uses. Um, but right now, it's pretty substandard. Yeah, and, and, last, and it's an awkward space. Yeah, and the last grant we did get for sports was up at the ball field, right? So, Steve, is yes. it? Eligible for those new King County levy dollars that we're getting? I was wondering about that. Yeah. Seems like I it could so. be. Absolutely. So, Steve, we're down to five minutes. Yes. So, uh, I've only got one item on the go to the order. I don't know how many others okay. you may have. Uh, are you at a point where you'd like to come back and do this again? Or? Well, I believe there's 32 slides in there, so I don't think we're going to get through that. Alrighty. We might as well call it a day and finish up with it. Let's do that. Okay. Alrighty. So on good the order, I was match left. I was going to recognize their new family member uh, that uh, mom and baby are doing well. I think it's nice as a council that we help represent our citizens, and we have a lot of younger citizens that have young children. And it's nice to know we have a council that just aren't a bunch of old people like me, but <coughs> folks that that have you know just everyday experience that our citizens have, and I. I appreciate seeing Matt as a family member and as a husband and a dad, and I think he just sets such a great example in our community. So he's not here to hear all that, so I'm not going to it's good. <laughs> so is there anything else for good of the order? So, uh, the last thing I'll mention, uh, I'd like to plan a formal council retreat uh, with city members uh, in February. That gives city an opportunity to, to help look at their schedules. Uh, I'll take a look at the Riverview School District midwinter break to make sure we don't land on that. Uh, there's also uh, been some interest in just having a council retreat, uh, maybe in January, just to talk about some key items, committees, and some other things. And I just wanted to gear interest in that. Uh, it does mean one more day in January. Uh, I don't think we have a ton of items that we take all day. We could probably do a four-hour 
brief retreat. Uh, we'd just be council members sitting down and having an opportunity to, uh, to discuss some of the, the key items we have, taking a look at what we'd like to try to accomplish this year. Um, so I, I'm just asking how council members feel. Do you want to try two retreats, one in January that would just be council and one in February? Um, I'll send out a uh, doodle poll for the February one so we can just see what works best for everybody. Generally, we've been shooting for a Friday or Saturday. Friday generally works better for city employees because they happen to be here and don't need to come back in on a Saturday. But I'll try to include both um, uh, Fridays and Saturdays as well. Um, thoughts, especially on having a council-only retreat. Of course, those are open to the public, and we announced those as well, but we'd likely do it right here in town. So if we could just go around and give me a sense of where folks are at. I'm for it. You're for it? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, go ahead. No, no after you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm fine with the council only as long as it doesn't involve sort of city business stuff. Yeah, because they yeah. need to be there. Right. Exactly. Because yeah. there's too many questions. Uh, mm -hmm. And if it, do you think we could do in three hours, like in an evening? Maybe? Oh, I think. Because my Saturdays in January are all booked. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we can keep this short. I don't think, I don't see us spending an entire day. It, Certainly depends on council members and what we have and agenda items and I'd work with you on making sure that we had key things so we weren't trying to cover 10 items. We would get two or three things that we think that we can discuss. It's tough here at the Cal where we want to have these discussions only because we have all this other important city business to deal with. The Auditor Exit Conference that we had today is an example. But I think it just truly gives a chance to sit down, be ourselves, talk, and, and be able to do that officially and and um, so on. Yeah, I'm going to both. That's Are you? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not, and Jennifer, I didn't want to forget you. Council Member Naplin, are you interested in having a council only a meeting in January? Yes. Can, can we propose a date tonight? Is that something we can look at? Uh, I think we can. Uh, do you mind if we just do it at your house? <laughs> you can always do it at my house. I don't have kids. Okay. And I don't. I won't have my new puppies until March. Okay. Well, since uh, we have all of our council members represented here, and we're looking in January, I don't have the Riverview School. Does anyone know know when that mid winter? February tenth to the fourteenth. So so far we're clear then. February 10th and 4th, I believe. The midwinter break, I'm pretty sure. Hold so on, actually, I have their calendar in my phone. I think there's another holiday in January. In January, there's one. Martin Luther King. Martin Luther yeah. King. Okay. Um, does council prefer a Friday or a Saturday? Yeah. Can we narrow that down? Doesn't matter. For January, I prefer Friday, mm -hmm. but I will be out of town the 22nd to the 26th. 22nd to the 26th. And Jen, you're out of town from how when do it? 22nd to the 26th, she said. So you've basically got the 18th, 17th, next Friday or Saturday, or the 31st and 1st. If we do do it on Saturday, can we do it earlier in the morning? Uh, I'm happy uh, to, to get up for a week for you. Yeah, what, what about the 17th? Participate as long as you can. Are you, so Matt is recommending we do it in the morning. I'm on, I'm on leave until the 26th, so I prefer not to take another Friday off before I want to get back to work. Oh, sounds good. So that's coming up quickly. It's next week. <laughs> that's why I said yeah. Uh, does the 17th work for council? Like, sure. put the other in the and work with you? Was that Saturday morning? or Because it's early release that day. So morning. what do we call early? Well, nine and ten. I'm retired, so ten's early. early but <laughs> <laughs> so are, are you, Matt, are you talking about eight o'clock? You mean like nine, nine thirty after the kids, the kids go to school? Kids go to school at nine, yeah. so nine, nine thirty would be. Nine thirty? Yeah. That are we good, good with nine thirty on the 17th? I'll check and see if the DCC is available if you guys want to go there or... Yeah, let's, let's shoot for that. Plan to meet at somebody's house. Coordinate that and get me an address because it'll be open to the public. <laughs> That's why it has to be before the dogs arrive. So 9.30 on January 17th and we would shoot for about a three-hour meeting. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? So 9.30 to 12.30. 
and um, there's several topics, but I'll send out an email and just say here's key topics and you know which ones. Um, the other way to do it is just have you send me your suggestions on what topics you want to consider. Can we do that? If you can just shoot me a memo or email and just say here's the key topic or the you know try to narrow it down, but I'll see if there's key ones that we we have on board here. Okay, well I think we've got that. Well let's call our meeting adjourned and we'll go into a city council meeting. Thank you.